Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Quantum Bridge with myself, Gary, and I'm going to pass over to my co-host, Casper, who will introduce our guest today. You were keen to get that over to me, weren't you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yep. Yeah, so welcome to the Quantum Bridge. And as uh, Gary was kind enough to point out, Today we're joined by a guest not known to Gary and not known maybe to some of you, but certainly known to me and definitely will be known to many of you as well. Uh, the inimitable, got the word right, Dorian Yates. Hi, mate. What's up, Casper? How you doing, mate? Uh, hello, good. Gary. Nice Welcome to meet you. Welcome to the show, Dorian. Congratulations on the podcast. Thank you very much. Good to That's see very you. Kind. That's very kind. Let's see, see where it all goes. Let's shake up the world together, my friend. Yeah, you know, it's just uh, have a chat and see what comes out. We've been, you know, I think the first time we met, when was that? Like 2011 or 12 or something? Yeah, it's it's over 10 years ago. That's right. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we got into some pretty interesting subjects in our first conversation without knowing each other. So I'm sure uh, we'll go into some deeper waters today, probably. That's right. It went from lifting weights to uh, the meaning of life fairly quickly, oh, yeah, which is yeah. <laughs> the way it should be. And just for those that don't know um, about my and Dorian's history at all, which most won't, we work together on this book, this wonderful book from The Shadow um, that we uh, we worked on together and we worked yeah, on for about six or seven yeah. years. Yeah, we weren't either in a, in a particular rush, I think, and... Uh, it's uh, you know it's quite revealing when you when you try to uh, remember your past, and it come you know it comes in spurts, and then you think, hold on, did that happen before that, or did it happen like that? And uh, it's it's a tricky thing the the memory, like they say with the, when the police when they have eyewitnesses, they they often get things totally wrong. Um, so it was an interesting process, yeah, and, and great to get the story out there so that people. Uh, you know, familiar with the journey that I went through and hopefully it inspires other people to believe, and, you know, let's say believe in your dreams, it's all a bit cliche and, and, and corny, you know, but like you do have much more power. We all do have much more power than we've been told, or even if we're a little bit aware, even more than we believe. And uh what I'm interested in is people that are scratching the surface of that. And um, the main thing is with me is what I put so much focus into, so much energy, so much focus um, came to fruition. You know, I put that signal, I put that energy out there. Of course, I did the physical steps as well. Um, and it's my story. So hopefully it inspires people to believe that they can um, create their own reality to a degree and their life can be many things, not just what the society and the environment around them and whatever is kind of projecting it and, and telling them. So that's the main thing I want to get out to people because I see it's like, it's kind of a shame when people don't realize much of their vast potential. Yeah, I remember a really lovely bit in the in that ended up in the book it was part of the conversations, ongoing conversations we had, which was when you first visited or saw the the sea for the first time. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the way that that had a profound effect on you. Yeah. I, I was telling my daughter that story, and uh, you know, I went to the seaside in real, and it wasn't like you know, a bit of a dysfunctional family, so I didn't have like a family holiday or anyone went with um, one of the girls that was doing riding lessons with my mom. Her family must have took pity on me and said, oh, let's, you know, let's take him along to Rio or something. And uh, I just came back from Rio de Janeiro on Copacabana Beach with my daughter, who's 21. And I told her the story then. I said, like, you know, I hadn't seen the sea until I was 12. I had no reference, maybe a lake or something. I don't know what I've seen, but just the vastness of it. Yeah, so... There's, uh, there's a whole world out there. And, uh, you know, through through my endeavors in bodybuilding, I've traveled. I'm going to sit down. I know I keep saying this. I'm going to sit down and write down how many countries I've been to. And uh, been there as, like, as an honored guest, you know, and you get to be friendly with the people there, and they're, they're from there. So it's a different experience than you would have even 
going as, as a tourist. So some of the things I've experienced have been priceless and kind of passing that on to my daughter, I said, like, you know, travel is one of the best things you can do. Never mind about go to university for five years. How about if you just travel for five years? Yeah. That you will probably learn a lot more practically. So trying to pass that on and uh, that curiosity. Uh, to my and the incredible thing is when you looked out across that, that sea, you know, it would have been hard to think about all the future friendships that lay out there, you know, that on some, uh, you know, in some way you just went through the motions as we've touched on before, that we all go through the motions in our lives and maybe it all is fate, but we still have to go through the motions, right? And the fact that you did that, you looked out across that vista yeah. and ultimately there were hundreds of people, ultimately tens of thousands of people and millions who, who, who were out there even then, who would get to know you or know of you or their children would. You couldn't have known that on a... No. No way I knew that. Level. No way I knew that, mate. But exactly, yeah. I did know quite early on that I don't really feel comfortable. I don't really fit in with um, what's around me, and there's much more. And I think you know, uh, obviously, it can be very negative. But for me, the TV, just seeing things on the TV, seeing America. Seeing New York and, and seeing Hawaii and fucking Hawaii Five O or whatever I don't know, you know these American shows that came over showed there was a whole new world out there, and at some point I connected bodybuilding with that as well, and it's really about freedom, you know that's what I worked out in the end. In order to get my freedom, I had to like for a while take my freedom away. You know, I had to kind of lock myself into that um, regime, that lifestyle in order to get somewhere where I wanted to get. And then when I was there, that, you know, took me some time to realize. But when I was there, then it gave me more freedom uh, to live my life on my terms and not be answering to anyone else or working for anyone else or or something like that. So the incredible thing is that your terms, right? That what what you might have thought of as just being on your terms and that people might push back against. For example, once you ended up in the States and then you were flown from one of the first competitions over to the West Coast and all of those amazing things went that happened that many, many millions of other people might well have dreamed about. Yeah. The things like um even even having somebody taking your images and you ostensibly pushing back against that ultimately even something like that you being yourself ended up setting a new trend and trajectory well, absolutely. it was just me being me i mean you know we could have sat down and strategized a great thing what about this image about this guy called the shadow that's all mysterious and he comes from a different country and never really knows anything about him well wow, that'd be a great marketing tool wouldn't it you know like but well, that was just me being me and I don't like feeling uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah, I'm not an actor. I don't feel comfortable trying to be something I'm not. So um, fortunately, the guy that I did my initial um, photography with, mostly for the first Flex magazine, was Chris Lund. Yep. Chris Lund was English, he was a Geordie, you know, still had his Geordie accent and everything. So he worked out there for the Weeder Company, for the magazines. But he was still very British, you know. So he got me, whereas the Americans didn't know, like, what's the story with this guy? Like, you know, they didn't get it at all. Yeah. He probably did. So I managed to say, listen, let's just try this, yeah. And uh, we tried some stuff with some heavy, proper heavy weights without all the posing stuff and everything. And uh, that was my first cover, and it became it became massive, this kind of a new type of a bodybuilder, like a very raw and blue collar, which is in fact what most of the guys buying the magazine. Absolutely. Were, yeah. you know? so, but isn't it amazing that at a time when... One of, one of our guys, you know, one of our guys from this shitty basement fucking sweat and gym is up there, you know? I think... But it was, but it was funny uh, that at a time it was all inauthentic, right? Then somebody comes along who is authentic, and strangely enough, that actually works. Right? It worked, yeah, because it was, maybe it was the time for things to Absolutely. change. Who knows? I mean, Joe tried, tried 
to mold me. We did one one attempt, which is out there somewhere, because it did give me one muscle and fitness cover. Uh, anyone that was from that era knows you had flex, which was hardcore bodybuilding. Yeah. So, you know, grunt and grimace and all that stuff that I was good at, yeah. And muscle and fitness was a more mainstream gym fitness magazine, always with a guy and a girl beach type situation, smiling model type thing, yeah. So he got me to do that, and I was just really uncomfortable with it, and he was trying his best to get me to smile and telling me why I should smile, because if you smile and you hold the protein, people want the protein because you're smiling. Like, uh, I, yeah, I get it, Joe. I know why you want me to smile there, yeah, but I just I can't really do it. And he's trying to get my ex-wife, Debbie, to get me to smile, all this stuff, the model, everything. I managed to, like, a Mona Lisa little bit of a thing, you know, Um but after trying for a while, he just said, ah, listen, listen, just let this guy do what he wants. That's how we deal with this guy. That's right, yeah. He came to this conclusion. And it worked. An hour, yeah? yeah. And uh, and it worked in the end for both of us. It wasn't what he envisioned, which was probably a new kind of Arnold-type figure, you know, Um but it worked, and in the end, it just like that's that's who Dorian is. That's what we got to work with. And I, I think it, the, the, thinking back, do you think that that was still the the whole inability to smile? Was it authenticity? Was it still the pain from the the death of your father? Was it the fact you were on a tunnel vision mission? Was it a combination of all of them? Have you, in terms of soul searching, which we did a lot of for the book, yeah, have yeah. you ever sort of come to terms with? why that was so difficult for you i think like most things is probably like multiple uh multiple things together it's never like a very simple answer but i didn't smile a lot and i didn't feel a lot of joy through the whole process really yeah. if i'm honest you know it was a mission i was at war that's the mentality yeah. and um i can't compromise yeah because if i compromise a little bit what, what's that going to lead to it's, you know going to lead to more compromise so it was just a very rigid structure and that i put myself into and i think most people thought that was me yeah like that's him. That's just the way he is. The guy's just, he's just a soldier. He's just disciplined. Yeah, it's a robot. Uh, I I made myself do that. Yeah, that's discipline. When you make, you know, yeah. when you've like basically programmed yourself to do it. Like, I'm well. This is what I'm going to do, and there will be no weakness. There will be no backstepping, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm going to do. So this takes a pretty intense mindset, and I kind of maintained it uh, <clears throat> most of the time. So there was that combined with the fact that very strangely enough for a bodybuilder, I didn't really like people looking at me and I didn't want my picture to be taken. And still to this day, I don't really want my picture to be taken. Yeah. I, I'm cool with it. I see it as part of my job and everything like that and everything. But, you know, Gal will tell you to get a private photo. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. I don't want to do it. You know? So I didn't like uh my contest prep presentation was always non-smiling simply because i didn't feel like smiling i'm coming yeah. here to compete and i feel like i'm competing and that's don't really feel like smiling i mean i've found it. latterly when we've been out right uh, this is well after your bodybuilding career of course but still when we've been out and we're you're relaxed right and we're both yeah. relaxed, doing something like that grabbing a picture with the spanish mountains as a backdrop it's cool. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't yeah. even ask you might volunteer it. But when you were in the zone, right? And even when I met you back in probably 92 when you were doing a signing and whatever, that air of wanting to do that sort of thing was not there. Not at all, mate. No, it was not. It, it, it was uh, it was like a job, you know? And I enjoyed the people, appreciated the, the, the people coming out and everything like that, but... Uh, the main thing in my mind was always like the goal, the goal, the goal. So you, you kind of, you know, they say 
blow down, smell the flowers, look at them. You know, you can always be wise after the fact. But the thing is, not many people could do what I did. So, and it takes a certain mindset, and it's so easy, especially in the early years when I didn't have much money, and there's more things going on and more distractions. So easy to get pulled out of that, you know, into something, into some drama, whatever, and takes you right off track. So I didn't even realize this myself, I suppose, until maybe not so long ago, that at heart, who are, who are you at heart? Go back to when you're a kid, yeah? Go back to when you're five years old. That's who you are at heart. At heart, I was a very free spirit. I love nature. I love being a free spirit. I didn't like rules. I still don't like rules, but apart from the ones I have to impose on myself, you know. Um, so at nature, I was a free spirit. And in order for me to achieve my goal in bodybuilding, that free spirit had to be curtailed. And the only one that would be able to do that was me. So I kind of had to put a little bit of myself in a cage. And then when the cage got open, then it was a little bit you know, it was a little bit hairy for a while, a bit crazy, you know, but had to be like that to balance out, I guess. Now I feel that everything I think about almost comes back to balance, you know. I'm, well, I'm well very... given that you've you've had the yoga journey, which is a lot to do with wholeness in that yeah. true holistic sense of that, I think that that yoga journey is it was, was necessary and was inevitable in some respect. Yeah, and um, to kind of balance out that such a high level of like masculine aggression, yeah. Yeah. aggression you know, like uh, it's all good. Everything has its purpose, man. But you're going to be <laughs> a bit off balance after doing 10, 12 years of, uh, of you know, bodybuilding training and have a hormone level like 10 times the average male, you know. So... Uh, it needed some balancing out, but it's kind of like all these things came subtly, came through messages. Sometimes that when I did psychedelics, it was like, you, you need to do this. So it was just one realization I got one time, like your body's all messed up, man. It's all like, can you sit in a squat? You used to be able to sit in a squat with like, you know, three plates aside and sit right on the yeah, yeah. And I was struggling to get down because everything was all tight and everything. So, um, I had to take a different route with the training because that's what my body needed in order to be a better functional unit. I didn't need to be, you know, isolating particular muscles and training them to death to try and get them bigger, to try and get everything moving as a unit. And I'm still, still working on it. And you know? I'm still doing some uh, did a Pilates class today. So that's whole body stuff, integrating everything. Um, you know, I'm in my sixties now. So it's more like you start thinking of your body more as this is your unit, this is your vehicle in order to experience the physical world. This is my vehicle, yeah. So I want to try and maintain it in a good working order. That's See, can you give Gary some thoughts about you know, he's uh, this is not his natural environment, but he feels that we're at a time where we've all got to come out and come to the fore and do our bit. You've had a lifetime of somewhat battling introversion not because you needed to in your normal life really but because yeah. of course you had a very extrovert lifestyle albeit an introvert having that lifestyle is there anything that you can say that you've learned along the way that's enabled you to cope with that um just at some point you become relaxed you know like doing a podcast interview or talking on stage and so on um i always find it quite easy having conversations rather than some people would like to do a speech maybe and have all the things prepared and everything. I think it depends on yourself, on how your brain works. But everything you do um, gets easier, man. You know, everything, right? Lifting weights or talking to people or whatever. So uh, if that's what the road that you think you should be going down, then mate, step down it, you know, or, Anything I mean, I was wondering with that, that um, be a little uncomfortable. Yeah, with that drive for freedom that you mentioned. Yeah. Do you do you think you would have done as well in the bodybuilding if you didn't have that? You know, 
Was that uh, helping you? No, no. I, I listen. If um, if I had a comfortable upbringing and all this stuff, you know, many things could be different in the story. Maybe I never would have done bodybuilding, and uh, if I had, would I have had that kind of drive? I don't know, but I always knew that I was destined for something different from everybody else. This I knew from uh, getting into like 16, 17, and just things have happened through my life and, and even people treated me differently because there was some air about me. Um, so I knew that. I just didn't know what it was. And when I got to bodybuilding, I knew this is what I want to do. But some parts of it, like being in the public eye and being on stage and speaking and everything, um, I wouldn't choose to do it because it's uncomfortable. Right? I didn't yeah. want to yeah, feel uncomfortable, right? But sometimes, well, very often, things that feel uncomfortable, the you need to explore them and, and and challenge them. So I'd look at it like that, you know. This is the where more, I'm at. The more comfortable you get with it, and don't don't worry about it. Just you know, just, I, I go on stage now and I just chat away like I'm talking to some friends or something. You know, we, we, we've always touched on. Strong- that idea of chilling and flowing, isn't it? So you've always managed to switch that on, even if actually it was to a no, million. Not, not at first, though, Casper. Here's the thing: not at first. At first, I yeah. was very nervous. My first seminar. That means that's me up here on a stage, talking now. Yeah. I can go up there and pose because I'm confident in my physique. Because well, you've done the work, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've done the work and yeah. it looks good and everything. So I feel like, oh, I feel. That was the first time I went on stage. I was like, shit, how am I going to feel on stage? All them people are going to be looking at me. Oh, where am I going to look? Do I look at the people? Do I look at the wall? I don't know what to do. I'm going to get up there. But when I got up there, the lights are quite bright anyway. So the crowd is a bit like, you know, you'd have to like concentrate to make people out. So I just looked at the back of the stage and I actually was surprised that I felt comfortable in that place, but I was not like, putting on a smile and show voting or whatever people wanted me to do i did it my own way um so yeah everything you do you'll just get a bit more comfortable with with practice if this is what you want to do just got to do it mate get used to it enjoy it is there so, a I, I there, Gary? Uh, and i had a pad here with like all my notes and everything yeah that helped me at first because without that prompter thing, I'd be very nervous. At least I knew I had some structure to follow. So for me, that that helped. But after a while, I got confident and I'd heard most of the questions before and I kind of got some kind of feel how to rapport with people, make a little joke now and then, get relaxed. Now I don't even think about it. I'm, I'm backstage with people sometimes and they're like, are you nervous? Like there's 500 people out there. I'm like, I, mean, I could be sleeping. I just don't even think about it anymore. It's just automatic because i've done it so many times so it's just a matter of repetition mate you know so it's one one area where plenty of repetitions are actually worthwhile mate yeah exactly volume counts in this case volume counts yeah yeah (laughs) now talking of that we won't get on to it in this particular um episode but we need to talk about where you're at at the moment not least with of course dy nutrition but specifically um to do with your new venture uh in terms of training and uh, yeah, a, a quantum leap in the world of training so uh, can you touch on that yeah, there's a, yeah there's a whole history behind this as, as you know because you worked on the book with me and, and you were familiar anyway with with the bodybuilding high intensity training arthur jones um nautilus nautilus machines yeah so Arthur Jones had the Nautilus machine company. He sold that after a period. He had a second company called Medex, which is again, it was some of the machines were for medical rehab and they were really, really great machines, but they came up against some opposition in the States because they were actually fixing people. What a huge surprise. Yeah, yeah. And that's not <laughs> convenient for some parties, yeah. Uh, and he made a line of gym equipment, which were like the best. Uh, mechanics out there anyway long story short um you know over the time 
I didn't hear anything about this company and recently found out that the company was still going and through a process, um, some other people have acquired it. So we're going to take medics and we plan to make small studios using high intensity training yeah. because I know if you follow a formula, you will get results, but you need to really follow the formula. So yeah. you need high intensity training, correctly supervised, monitored, high intensity training. 20 to 30 minutes twice a week that's all you need i say to so many people i said oh but i don't have the time i say look if you had 30 or 40 minutes to spend with me twice a week and you followed a diet which i gave you you would literally change your life because you'll change your physical health so much which will enhance your mental health everything just gets better yeah. so you don't need a lot of time that's the number one thing and science has proven what Arthur Jones was saying in you know 1970 is being validated over and over again now in scientific studies, even for cardiovascular training, that interval, high intensity interval training is the way to go. And uh, interesting as well, I saw uh, Jordan Peterson the other day. Um, I like to watch him. And he said, you know, we've been told about all this brain training you know, puzzles and brain training and all that stuff, you know, I've been doing it myself. So we've been, they've been studying these brain training methods for 50 years and absolutely failed to show any positive benefit. There's only one thing which benefits your cognitive uh, health uh, and stops the decline and maintains your memory as you're getting older, and that is called lifting weights. Yeah. So all round. So the idea is to have a high intensity studio and um, offer along with this the uh, the nutritional plan as well. So you've got the training and the nutrition. And we're also going to do assessment as well. So with the clients, we're going to assess their body fat. We're going to assess their VO2 max. We're going to assess the hormones, all those things. So a one-stop shop for all the things you need, especially as you're getting older, if you have the the correct training, the correct nutrition, and you're healthy and your hormones in, hormones are in a good balance, you you're going to progress. It's a formula. Yeah. So Steve, we we want to get that out there. You know, that's the plan. We're up against a bit of t a timeline on this particular one. Will you consider coming back and uh, talking us through that? As really a you know, next time I come on, we'll probably be uh, further along the line with the whole story and i can tell you a bit more because we're just yeah. really gone through the purchase uh at the moment so you know it's uh it's going to be a couple of it's years an exciting one and it it requires yeah. a bit of delving into and uh let's if you don't mind let's try and do that together absolutely mate i think it's a formula and uh it's it'll be a huge leap forward using technology in the gym industry which has not been utilized yet and we have an industry you know, let's say uh, this industry has been going 50 years and I would argue it hasn't really delivered on what it's supposed to deliver on in the first yeah. place because people are getting results. Sometimes they may, but I think if you look percentage-wise, it's not been very efficient, the current model. Let's change it. Okay, mate, we're going to have to wrap up. Um, All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Anytime, and, uh, mate. It's the first of many, I hope. Anytime, mate. And um, i got the studio now, I think, that I'm going to do my podcast in. And uh, I can do the audio book there as well. So Brilliant. Brilliant. I've got the book into audio, you know what I mean? Okay, guys. 